Hi, welcome to part two of China Global Innovation Superpower. In part one, Andrew Gore outlined the economic and innovation drivers for China and the implications for the rest of the world. Enjoy part two. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for Andrew's very interesting presentation. And uh, also, what I would like to share in the next uh, uh, twenty minutes or so. Uh, to share of some of my observations and uh, research on China innovation. So, what I like to do is to provide a broader perspective by looking at different dimensions of the innovation challenge and opportunities. So, first, I would like to look at more a macro level data to look at the um, so-called mid-income trap. So, how China's development and how innovation may help China to overcome the mid-income trap. And secondly, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, international uh, joint ventures. So as we know that China has basically benefited uh, substantially in the past 40 years. And then how the joint venture form contributed to the innovation activities and performance in China. A third aspect I would like to share is on the role played by the talent, in particular, the entrepreneur talent, when people move around the world, and entrepreneur talent in this case. So I'd like to share some of my research and then to look at how the talent mobility can contribute to the Chinese innovation and entrepreneurship movement. And because as, as, as I know, uh, we have also some corporate uh, um, participants, so I will also talk a little bit about the corporate venturing in China. So although it started quite late, but it has developed uh, quite quickly in the past 20 years. And last but not least, I would like to share some of my thoughts and observations on the digital economy and how technology can play a role to transform the Chinese economy, particularly in the post-COVID. So the basic structure I just mentioned, and then I will first take a quick look at the China's innovation challenge. So as we know, there is a notion called the mid-income trap. So it's basically the economic development situation when a country that attains a certain income, but stuck at that level. So the World Bank has defined what does mid-income rent mean. And as we can see, many transforming economies actually encounter the mid-income trap. In order for China to overcome this mid-income trap, innovation becomes critical. Also, the so-called indigenous innovation, which means China needs to innovate by itself, not just copy or, or imitate the other players. So the one important element when we look at the innovation, I think is the FDI, because as we know, uh, Chinese economy in the past 40 years basically benefited from this um, investment from abroad, so foreign direct investment in China especially after China's reform and opening in the late 70s. FDI has become the principal driver for economic growth for China. And one important organization form is actually the international joint venture. Here I'd like to share one study. Uh, we look at um, and what conditions the international joint venture can actually contribute to the innovation performance. So we look at over 300 multinational companies who have uh, innovation operation um, in China um, based on the research and also combined with the case study. We found out important thing is the reciprocity and long-term relationship between the clever partnerships can generate superior innovation performance. So in this paper, we also look at both product innovation and process innovation. So the message is actually quite simple. It means that when the multinational companies go to China, 
they need to commit a long term. Uh, think about the long term commitment and collaborate with local partners. And that actually contribute a lot to the innovation performance. So to rationally with Andrew's earlier example on the car manufacturing industry. So the auto industry at the very beginning, the big car manufacturers, they all form joint ventures in China, like uh, Volkswagen, BMW. And then because of this joint venture, it's actually contribute to the entire industry innovation. That's why when today you look at, there are many, many Chinese car manufacturers like GD or Chang'an Auto. Why it could happen? Because the joint venture is an important form, help the local players, particularly the suppliers, to enhance their innovation capabilities and enhance their ability to produce high quality components for the car manufacturers. So I think that may be a, also an example to show you that actually this form, in particular international venture, has contributed a lot to the innovation performance in China. And another example I would like to share is the important role played by the talent. So there's a rising phenomenon of the entrepreneurial talent mobility and entrepreneurship. Actually, this phenomenon is not new for China. So Professor uh, Saxenia from UC Berkeley, 15 years ago already published a book called The Regional Advantage in a Global Economy. And a key message she talked about is how Silicon Valley connected to the other peripheral economies. For example, Israel becomes a new innovation center. And her argument is because people mobility. These talent move across geographic boundaries, bring knowledge, bring expertise, and bring know-how to help other areas to develop quickly. So this phenomenon actually is happening in China. I think this is very important element we should also pay attention to. In 2016, uh, together with uh, State Councilor Dr. Wang, I edited a, a book called uh, Entrepreneurship and Talent uh, Management from a Global Perspective with a focus on the global returnees. So we look at the case of China, but also put in a comparative perspective to look at the other innovation regions, for example, Silicon Valley and uh, in France and Italy, and under the notion of the ecosystem. So how to build an innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem and the role played by the entrepreneurial talent. So later on, I will share one particular study which look at how the talent can really contribute to the regional economy and regional innovation in the context of China. So what is the benefit of talent mobility uh, when these people move across the board? So I early on mentioned uh, the key thing is knowledge transfer and, and spin over. So when people bring this knowledge, they can actually interact with the local actors and organizations and help them to enhance their ability, also to enhance their knowledge. So as mentioned earlier on the example of Silicon Valley and the rise of the Israel high-tech emergency is basically because of a connection of people. And there are also in China actually a number of policy initiatives in order to attract talent from, a world, from all over the world. And also research has shown that these returning entrepreneurs, they can actually contribute to the development, in particular accelerate the development of high-tech industry. For example, software, and uh, I also have, have a research on solar energy. So is also you can see them as a scale up of the particular high-tech industry. So before we delve into a particular study, I just want to share a broader picture of the research I have done in the past five years, uh, looking at the uh, entrepreneur mobility, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship in China. So I look at both from the individual levels and also from the organizational levels, 
and uh, regional levels, um, institutional level, as well as, as well as how cultural affect the entrepreneurial behaviors. So what I like to do here, we'll briefly discuss the third uh, study. So innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem on a regional level, which is published in the Tech Innovation. So before we talk about the regional innovation entrepreneurship, I like to bring everybody on the same page. Just briefly introduce a concept. So one popular concept to explain regional entrepreneurship and innovation development is called triple helix. And, and this concept is quite straightforward and intuitive. It basically means in order for a region to become innovative and uh, to promote entrepreneurship, you need three sectors, industry, university, and government. And not only these three sectors are important, but if you look at in the middle of the wind chart, their interaction, so the overlap between different sectors, that is where the innovation can really take place. And if you look at the examples around the world, so particularly in the Western context, this triple headaches model works. Uh, if you look at the uh, Silicon Valley we mentioned earlier, they have uh, Stanford University and UC Berkeley, very top universities. And then if you look at the uh, US in the East Coast, Route 128, they have MIT and Harvard. If we come back to the UK, we have Cambridge area. And as we know, uh, Cambridge has built an ecosystem and produced a lot of spin-offs and become a very vibrant entrepreneur ecosystem in the UK. And if you look at the Israel, they have a University um, Tel Aviv and also Hafen Technical Universities. Even in Germany, uh, there is a very famous Max Planck Institute, uh, which is uh, focused on the biochemistry. So if you look at examples around the Western context, the triple helix uh, model I just mentioned earlier actor works. So university contributes a lot to the region innovation entrepreneurship, and actually you have universities. But however, this particular study, what we try to understand is, if you really understand China, so China is not just one area. They are very different, and the different regions have a very different characteristics. So if you think about the universities in China, the top university are all allocated in the big cities. For example, Beijing, Shanghai, or Guangzhou. But in the second tier cities, they do not have very established or good universities. So in that case, can we also use the triple helix model? If not, how can we incorporate the local context in order to explain the phenomenon we observe? Because in China, the second tier city do have entrepreneurship. They do innovate. So that is really where this particular research comes from. So I will not go to all the technical details, but I just want to share some top line findings and observations. So before we look at this particular example, I would like to talk a little bit about the policy that China has been um, kind of using in the past four years. And as we mentioned, the very beginning example, the FDI, that is actually the economic model how China has developed so quickly by attracting and, and form international joint ventures. And, uh, but however, um, as we can see today, China has shifted more towards a talent-oriented policy. For instance, so here I just list a couple of examples and programs from China and with a particular target to attract the best talent from all over the world. So for example, 2008, uh, China has launched this uh, thousand talents program. 2010, they have the thousand young talent program. In 2011, they even have a particular program targeted foreign experts. So if you have foreign experts, you can also come to China and contribute become the talent program candidate. And there is also uh, like a later on 10,000 talent program and many, many more. So these are just the national level, but also on the regional level, 
there are also many other uh, programs. So, which means that the talent policy has really become a national policy in China in order to attract. So, so here I'd like just to share a quick summary of this research. And uh, in this particular study, uh, we bring more um, contextual understanding. We really try to understand if in a region that they do not have a well-established university, how can this region become innovative? How can this region promote entrepreneurship? And we look at two cities, uh, two second tier cities. So from a comparative lens, we look at both the Suzhou and Wuxi. And to summarize, it's very interesting finding we found out, actually there are two options to build or deal with university capability. One is to establish a new university and research institute. That's exactly what happened in Suzhou. In the case of Wuxi, they took an alternative approach by attracting overseas talent and returnees. And if you look at these two uh, cities uh, comparatively, and what I here I like to highlight, so the interesting thing is, if you look at the case of Suzhou, it's a very much a conventional model. Uh, they attract FTI because they also have the Singapore Suzhou uh, Industrial Park, which is the national level. So, and because they have internal demand, they need more talent. So the government, a local government in Suzhou, uh, took initiative and become an active designer to build new universities. However, in the case of Wuxi, here, the returnees uh, come to China, and particularly comes to Wuxi, and then they negotiate or interact with the local government. And later on, they can also play the role as a kind of as a university and provide the university capability in order for the region to develop innovation and entrepreneurship. So, uh, because the importance of talent, uh, I also uh, added a, a research handbook last year. It's called International Talent Management. So, with the hope to bring and highlight the role of talent. And as you can see, this book will have three different parts. Uh, the first part is focus on innovation and entrepreneurship and try to look at the role uh, talent can play uh, to promote innovation. And we also have uh, not only the case of China, but also from uh, around the world. And the second part is about the talent and international business. Here is more about multinational companies. And the third part is about uh, talent management and public public management sustainability. So we really try to provide uh, a textbook for uh, PhD students and, uh, and, and early career researchers who are interested to understand because I believe that talent is a very, very important element contribute to the innovation activities and processes as well as the outcome. So what I like to share here is uh, just take a, a very quick look at the China's uh, copper venturing. So we call it um, copper venture capital. So it started relatively late. However, it has developed very quickly. So if especially the big companies, uh, for example, the internet giant, BAT, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, they all have their own investment arms, uh, they venturing uh, on behalf of the corporate. Now, if you can look at the, the bar chart, uh, it also shows that actually uh, on the left-hand side, the number of, of the investment cases, and the right-hand side shows that the total investment volume. So it's actually uh, dramatically developed over the last 20 years. And um, so, but maybe you have the question, about these, uh, which are the sectors that the uh, CVC actually invest? So this is a recent report. I think it shows some interesting findings. If you look at uh, the left-hand side, which is the CVC investment strategy, uh, industry uh, distribution, a significant amount has been invested in information transmission, software, and, and information technology sectors, almost 40%. And 
manufacturer industry only ranked a second, but only have about 13%. If you look at the right-hand side of the figure, which is the independent venture capital, uh, the software information technology and the manufacturing industry almost similar, uh, 25, 25, 20, 25 percent. So I think the one key reason is because China has a lot of like a big industry a digital giant, uh, particularly this uh, BAT, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. And if you look at uh, more closely, uh, what are the differences between the CVC in the traditional industry versus in the internet industry? So the key difference, I think, is for the internet uh, giant, they have built an ecosystem around themselves. So by doing that, they can share their customer base, they can share their channels, and they can actually also to help the venture to grow and scale up quickly. For example, like Tencent invested in Jingdong.com. So it's become the second largest e-commerce platform, uh, almost um, kind of very strong competitor to Alibaba. And also Tencent invest, invested in Pinduoduo, uh, recently Pinduoduo, uh, has uh, has uh, increased the value market value dramatically, so I think that is really the difference between the, the conventional CVC and the internet CVC. So last but not least, what I like to talk a little bit about here is uh, to look at the Chinese technology and particular look at the um, in the current. Um, let's say post COVID-19 uh, time. Because in early this year, when the COVID, we all know that has uh, changed uh, our lives and work, not only in China, but around the world. And when COVID happened in China this year, early, two, uh, early 2020, China actually has already become an internet powerhouse. The entire society, uh, not only individuals, but also organizations, are already digitalized to some extent. Uh, so you can see that uh, um, as Andrew uh, example earlier, like uh, the payment. Uh, so almost everybody has a smartphone. Uh, so not only in the cities, but also in the rural areas. So this basic digital infrastructure provide a very important foundation for China to quickly develop the techniques to combat the COVID-19. So to, let's simply put the digital technology supporting information transmission prevention control of the epidemic based on very strong network and different technologies. And particular, for example, cloud computing and after intelligence and all these all contributed dramatically to this. And also at the same time, the social economic operations during the epidemic also changed. So today we talk about uh, the future of work or the new norm of work in the post COVID time. So for example, people tend to shop online and then a lot of services actually have been moved from offline to online. For example, like uh, uh, distance learning and um, online education, online healthcare, and this has all emerged as a result of the new digital economy ecosystem. And this actually has a quite important implications for innovation for both China and the world in the future. Because when COVID-19 came, so there was a metaphor called wartime response. And because of wartime response, it actually accelerated the development of China's digital economy. Because as we know, the, we always have the excuses not to change digital because of the switching cost or because of the past dependence. But in the wartime response, companies have to change. They have to respond quickly. Now, if they don't, then they probably could not survive. So therefore, because of the external shock, it actually breaks the lock-in and became a major drive in promoting the digital economy in China. And I think, this sense of urgency to, tr to accelerate uh, digital transformation in China will have a 
dramatic implications for China's innovation and probably for the world in the future to come. So thank you very much for your listening. Thank you. Good. Thank, thank you very much there. Re really insightful. Uh... Thank you for watching and trust you found that of value. Part one and other videos are available on the Aim of Our Purpose to Performance YouTube channel. Thank you.